The next Torah portion in the book of Genesis is Noah. It picks up where the first portion left off, which is the inhabitants of the earth corrupting themselves, becoming degraded. It's uncertain what exactly this means, but in this portion, the text states that the world was filled with Hamas, Hamas, um, which is a Hebrew word for violence. Now it states uh, that Noah was righteous, and that's why God chose him and his family to repopulate the earth. Now we don't really know what it means to be righteous yet, but generally it means to emulate God, emulate God's behavior. As God is kind, you be kind. As God is just, you be just. But we don't really have a clear statement of God's characteristics from the first Genesis portion. We don't really know or we aren't really told what God's qualities are in the first portion of Genesis. But we do have the creation story. And from that we can infer certain qualities, certain properties, certain characteristics of God. These include creativity, the exercise of free will, generosity, um, rewarding and punishing. So for whatever reason, Noah is singled out as being the most righteous person in his generation. And God appears to Noah in prophecy and tells him that a flood is about to come upon the earth and to build an ark to move at least one pair of every animal into the ark along with Noah, his wife, his sons, and his daughters-in-law. One of the interesting questions that arise in this story is why Noah does not plead to God to save the earth. For example, in a few more chapters we will come across the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and God warns Abraham that Sodom and Gomorrah are about to be destroyed because of their sinfulness. And Abraham spends a fair amount of time arguing with God to reverse the sentence. So we don't hear an objection from Noah to God's decree to flood the earth and to kill everything on it. Nor do we read about him warning his community about what's going to happen. In any event, it starts to rain 40 days and 40 nights, quite a high flood. I think it's 150 cubits, which would be more than 450 feet of water. So after that period of rain, Noah sends out a couple of birds to see if the land has dried. First he sends out a raven, which does not come back and then he sends out a dove who, after a couple of trips, returns with an olive leaf. After Noah and his family depart, along with all of the animals that were kept in the ark, God makes a promise with Noah, a covenant, to never destroy the earth with a flood again. That does not necessarily preclude other disasters, but at least by a flood, the earth will not be utterly destroyed again. And as a symbol of that covenant is the rainbow. Now, some people might say, well, weren't there rainbows before? Of course there were, but now the rainbow has become a symbol of that covenant. There are certain changes which occur. The lifespan of man shrinks dramatically from the 900 years, 800 years or so, to 500, 400, 300, then 200. Also, uh, the diet of man changes. Man is now allowed to eat meat, which was not the case before. And two additional prohibitions are laid down, one against murder and one against suicide. And when it comes to eating meat, one cannot drink the blood. The blood needs to be drained before the meat is eaten. That's because the soul, the spirit of life, is in the blood. And you don't want to be eating the spirit, you just want to be eating the flesh. So within a short period of time, Noah plants a vineyard, 
harvests the wine, ferments it, and gets drunk with the wine that he makes. One of his sons discovers him naked in his tent and tells the other two brothers. The other two brothers cover Noah with a cloth, with a garment, and when Noah wakes up, he curses Canaan, one of the grandsons, rather than the son who originally discovered him. There's interesting questions about this. Why didn't Noah curse the son who discovered him and may have taunted him or embarrassed him or some such thing? But because of God originally blessing Noah and his sons, there was a prohibition or an impossibility of then cursing that son. And so the curse landed on the grandson. Once the Noah narrative is completed, there's a listing of 70 genealogies that account for all of the nations of the world, which repopulate the world after the flood. One of the directives given to Noah and his descendants is to spread out and to fill the earth again. Nimrod makes an appearance in the genealogies as the first king and uh, the first person to establish kingdoms. So interesting footnote there. So the genealogies are interrupted by the account of the Tower of Babel. Now once people started to increase in numbers once again, they all congregated in one valley and started building a tower and a city in order to not be dispersed. So there's questions, what was the sin of the generation of the tower? And um, some think it's hubris because they wanted to build a tower up to the heavens. But I think the more fundamental issue is that they did not want to disperse. They all spoke one language which allowed them to work together and stay together. But once they made the decision to not disperse, that's when God confused their tongues. And they all kind of split up after that. The word Babel comes from the Hebrew Balal, which means to confuse or to confound or to mix up. So it isn't necessarily that Babel is the derivation of the tower, but the Hebrew is transliterated into the word Babel, which then becomes the origin of the word to Babel. This portion ends with the account of Abraham's birth in ur Kasdim, which is someplace in Mesopotamia. Abraham's father decides, for unknown reasons, to begin traveling to Canaan. So he takes his extended family to Canaan. So this includes Abraham, his two brothers, his nephew Lot, and the wives. For unknown reasons, they stop their journey to Canaan, and uh, they settle in another city on the way to Canaan. They make a point in describing Sarah, Abraham's wife, that she is barren and has no children. So that may be one of the reasons that they then uh, take responsibility for Lot, their nephew, whose father died, one of Abraham's brothers. So that's where the portion Noah ends. Next week is Lech Lecha, uh, which is the beginning of Abraham's sojourning in Canaan and environs. So I hope you enjoyed this little talk about Noah, or the portion Noah, and uh, like the video, please, and subscribe to my channel. Thank you.